The following program is brought to you in part by the film Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace. Welcome to another Leon China Report. We have a really eclectic and exciting show tonight. I mean, the gap between Israelis, uh, Jews and Israeli Arabs is now much wider and now much deeper than it was. And uh, the positions held by the Arab parties became very nationalist. It will be much more difficult than it was in the past, but theoretically it can happen. Well, in the past, you know, uh, Arab parties were not part of the Rabin coalition, but they gave him support and allowed him to stay in power when uh, um, uh, he had a strong opposition from the Likud party and the uh, allies of the Likud in the right, and the Arabs were those who uh, gave him support, and thanks to the Arab support, he managed to stay in power for almost four uh, years. Hamas sees ISIS as a threat because ISIS doesn't recognize Hamas. For ISIS, I mean there is only ISIS. And uh, Hamas uh, should subordinate itself to ISIS, accept the rule of ISIS. This is something that is unacceptable by, uh, by uh, Hamas. So I see no room for no ring, no uh, possibility for any future cooperation between those good, uh, two organizations. In the past, when ISIS or his allies tried to establish themselves in, in Gaza, immediately they were uh, destroyed by uh, Hamas, which sees them as a threat to its existence. Uh, so I don't see any way they will try to cooperate. But, but ISIS has the northern front, and through this front he can uh, launch attacks and hope in uh, war with Israel. Israel was uh, installed here by the West. It's a Western country. Uh, I think that the most they hate the Shiites. I mean, those who pretend to be good Arabs or good Muslim, but are not supporters of ISIS. They are the real enemy, the immediate enemy. After that, we'll, we'll see. Israel, the United States, who will come first, will be the one that will uh, suffer. But uh, for ISIS, there is no big difference between the United States and Israel. Uh, it's not in the interest of any of the sides to resume uh, hostilities and to uh, start a new war. And still, you know, everybody uh, knows that it is a possibility, I mean, that because of an Israeli attack or because of an incident here or there or because of events in the West Bank, something can happen also along the uh, Israeli-Hamas border in, in, in Gaza. So clearly they prepare themselves for the next round. Uh, can we avoid this round? Uh, maybe, I doubt it very much because uh, they don't want to make peace with Israel. All what they want is to maintain some delicate um, balance uh, of uh, deter uh, of fear between Israelis and, uh, and, 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 and uh, Hamas and its allies, uh, but they are not interested in achieving any progress or achieving any peace. This is to say they will stick to their uh, previous uh, positions. And uh, if this is the situation, you can contain the tension, you can uh, avoid this time, next time, but eventually the next round is unavoidable. We are going nowhere. I mean, there is no any trust. 
But at the same time, they are in Gaza, he is in the West Bank. Israel was not uh, able to destroy and get rid of Hamas, so we can't accept, expect Abu Mazen to get rid of Hamas. He's not as stronger as, he, uh, as Israel was, and still. Uh, but they need to accept each other. I mean, Abu Mazen is in the West Bank, uh, thanks to Israeli support or the Israeli shelter, but he is there. Hamas the effect on the ground in Gaza, and they need to uh, learn to live with each other, do not trust each other, do not love each other, but uh, that's the reality on the ground, and uh, that's what we uh, see there. I mean, uh, the Palestinian public ask them, demand them for more cooperation, for the formation of a unity government. So, you know, they do understand that they need to respond to such public pressure, and from time to time you see them uh, conducting uh, dialogues, but uh, these are not uh, real. And uh, eventually, uh, Abu Mazen knows that Hamas is a major threat for him. Well, Gaza was part of uh, mandatory Palestine, and after the partition resolution and after the independence war, it was occupied by Egypt. And for almost uh, 20, uh, almost 25 years, till, uh, or 20 years, till the 67 uh, war, it was, it was part of uh, Egypt under Egyptian military uh, control, the Palestinians were held in refugee camps and uh, were treated very badly by the Egyptian authorities, but it was part of Egypt. It was occupied by uh, Israel and uh, became, well, not uh, an immediate part of Israel, but a region which was held by Israel, what we call the occupied uh, territories. In Israel, uh, debate uh, started immediately whether it should be annexed to Israel, whether it should be part of Israel, but there were those Israelis who said mainly uh, because of the demographic uh, factor, I mean, too many Palestinians, uh, it should be given to Egypt, maybe. It should. Eventually, Ariel Sharon in 2005 decided uh, that Israel should disengage itself from uh, this uh, territory, uh, Israeli forces withdrew from uh, Gaza and it became so-called independent. I mean, uh, it was given to the Palestinian Authority, but immediately, a year later, uh, Hamas uh, conducted uh, a military coup, took over and turned Israel, Gaza uh, to a military base aimed at uh, Israel. There are Palestinians, historically, they were part of uh, the mandatory Palestine, but because of the separation from the West Bank, because for almost 10 years now there is uh, the Hamas government and the Hamas control, people do speculate that actually we will not have one Palestinian state, but two Palestinian states, one in West Bank held by uh, Abu Mazen and the other in Gaza held by Hamas. For many years they were under Egyptian rule, they were influenced by the Egyptian. The dialect even is more similar to the Egyptian as compared to the dialect, spoken dialect in the West Bank, which is more similar to the dialect spoken in uh, Jordan, for example. If there is goodwill, if there is a trust, you know, you can uh, link them together, uh, train, railroad, you know, bridges, uh, tunnels, I mean, and uh, the move can be in such a case very easily, smoothly, but, but of course there is no trust and uh, I think that Abu Mazen doesn't want to link itself to, uh, link himself to Gaza because it means that, you know, through these tunnel bridges, railroads, uh, fighters of Hamas will get to the West Bank, so right now he has no interest in such. Uh, uh, he has no alternative right now, I don't think that he's the strongest, but there is no any other alternative, and uh, with this indirect support of Israel, he is in, uh, in power, but if there were a democratic uh, free election, I doubt it very, mu uh, very much whether he could uh, you know, survived and win domestically within the PLO and, of course, vis-a-vis -vis the Hamas. I mean, unless there is progress, I mean, because in the long run, it's in the interest of Israel that 
Gaza will be controlled by a moderate Palestinian authority or state, but it's not the case right now. We have a problem, you know, because uh, so much hate, you know, even Anwar Sadat in the 50s, it was uh, announced, uh, it was assumed that Hitler was still alive. And he wrote a letter to Hitler, you uh, were such a great leader and I wish we could have met. Yes, they, uh, nobody likes uh, Israel here and at the same time, you know, they are realistic and uh, Abu Mazen was one who the problem is that sometimes we expect our enemies uh, to really reconcile, to love us, to accept our existence. We have to accept the fact that it's not uh, the case. The usual Arab reaction or position towards Israel is that we hate you, we deny the Holocaust, we want you to disappear, but you are here, so let's think together what we can do about it. I mean, and in such a case, you call this guy pragmatist, uh, realistic, and you have to work with him. Well, in the case of Barak, Barak always knew better that any, than anyone else, you know. This is the problem with politicians. They know better than all of us. And uh, at that point, he didn't consult uh, anyone. But, you know, the Arab Spring was a great surprise for even the experts. And I guess that if he would have uh, consulted any given expert, this expert would have told him, you know, yes, make peace with Syria because this is a strong and stable state with a stable regime. But uh, sometimes even the experts have no real answer. <laughs> we used to say, you know, Bashar is not like his father, his lack of any uh, killer instinct. Uh, well, when you look at what Bashar did, these were different uh, times and uh, different challenges and he was a different uh, man. I don't think that uh, he would have done something dramatically different than, than the sun. It's, it's the same mentality, the same structure of the regime. They are coming from the same family, from the same tradition. So I guess it would have uh, been the same. The Leon Sharney Report congratulates the team of BDC, The Price of Peace, and Leon Sharney on the New York Emmy Awards win. The documentary reveals the true story of the negotiations leading up to the greatest diplomatic achievement of our time, the Camp David Accords between Israel and Egypt. Watch it on Hulu.com or buy the special feature edition DVD at select stores. Now get the book the hit movie was based on, Leon Charney's Backdoor Channels. Learn about the backdoor channel negotiations that led to the historic 1978 Israeli-Egyptian peace treaty. Become a witness to history and order backdoor channels online at Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Also available at all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at iTunes or Audible.com. Relive history. Order backdoor channels. Get best-selling author Leon Charney's latest book, The Battle of the Two Talmuds. Join Charney as he explores years of Jewish history to find out why and how Talmudic scholars and rabbis abandoned the Holy Land for the lands of the Diaspora. Learn about the power struggles behind the creation of the Jerusalem and Babylonian Talmuds. It's a book critics call engaging and enlightening, a book which will be of interest to people of every faith. Now available at Amazon and Barnes & Noble, or download the audiobook of The Battle of the Two Talmuds at iTunes or Audible.com. Leon Charney sets out to discover the true meaning of the Kaddish, the Jewish custom of reciting a prayer to commemorate the death of a close relative. Join Charney as he finds out the history of the Kaddish and how it has evolved. Reviewed as a refreshing walk through Jewish history and a book that deserves to be read by both Jews and non-Jews, The Mystery of the Kaddish is now available online at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at audible.com or on iTunes. Discover The Mystery of the Kaddish.
Available now over iTunes, Amazon, and Google Play. Leon Charney's cantorial CD in Disco Long. Listen as Charney movingly sings El Mole Rachamim and Charney's amazing rendition of a disco remix of Adon Olam, all sung in the incredible and individual Charney style. Also listen to the CDs on Rhapsody. Download Leon Charney's cantorial songs in Disco Lam, the disco remix of Adon Olam on Amazon, iTunes, and Google Play. Or listen in on Rhapsody, all available now. Hi, I'm Leon Charney, and this is the Leon Charney Report, and we're coming to you live from Tel Aviv, Israel, where we have the honor of uh, doing a one-on-one -on -one profile with Yitzhak Shamir, one of the most interesting prime ministers in the history of Israel, the second longest serving one after Ben-Gurion, a man who was there for the Madrid Peace Conference, a man who was there during the scudding of Israel, a man who's met all the presidents from Carter on, that's Reagan and Bush, and uh, who, who knows everybody, and we're going to get his insights. This will be a personal profile. A man will tell you what Israel is going to look like with this new peace agreement, or if it's not an agreement, at least it's uh, something that's been signed upon, and then he'll tell us what he thinks the future looks like. Don't leave us. We'll be back after commercial break. For Mr. Shamir, pleasure to welcome you to our show, and uh, we thank you for making time for us. Uh, it's a very troublesome time for you as an ex-prime minister who led the government for uh, your second longest reigning prime minister in the history of Israel. I know what you say it doesn't mean much, but it means a lot to a lot of people. Or, Give me your feelings today about uh, this Knesset vote that took place last Thursday. Well, first of all, I, am, uh, I welcome you and I'm very glad to see you and to talk with you. I know about you. I never had a real opportunity to talk with each other, but you are right when you say that I am very, very unhappy. I'm very disappointed in these days, and I'm very worried, very worried, because I know where all this agreement could bring us, could bring Israel. My only hope is that these agreements will uh, not become a reality, because otherwise, we will lose, uh, I don't want to say what, but we will lose. And uh, I don't like, you know, to appear in the, on the outside world with criticism against our government. But uh, I don't have any choice. When uh, some people ask me, I must say that our government is wrong, is on the wrong way, and uh, we have to replace it. There is no other way. Is it a fait accompli, though? <coughs> what can Israel do at this point? I don't think <coughs> it's a fait accompli. Uh, I don't think that uh, it exists such a thing in politics that you cannot change. Uh, things, you know, down by people could be hunted down by people. And, uh, but uh, there is, there will be damage, there will be damage, uh, considerable damage, but uh, I don't, I don't know any government that conducts a policy that is against its uh, uh, philosophy, its conscience. When, for instance, the Likud will come to power, he will not conduct the policy of the Labour Party. It's very clear. And uh, I think they, they will find ways, and my friends will find ways to change the situation. You've had an illustrious career in this country. You were head of the, the Lehi Party, and then you became Speaker of the House, and you became the Prime Minister. Uh, you know this country better than most people. You're sort of the eldest statesman in this country. Do you think that you can reverse something, an agreement that world opinion has, uh, in a sense, uh, committed itself to? Yeah, I think it, as I said before, there's nothing is irreversible. Nothing is irreversible. You know, if you will study the history of any country, you will see it. You can change anything. It depends how, it depends how it, uh, how much energy it will take, how much time it will you have, you will have to invest in it. But I don't think that it is irreversible. 
I know the public opinion, of course, but the public opinion will uh, see, I think, in a very short while that this agreement is not workable. What is the platform of the Likud with respect to the Palestinian issue? Well, I think we are uh, still uh, uh, respecting this, uh, the Camp David agreements. The, uh, not, maybe not all the details, but uh, the basic uh, roots and the basic uh, foundations of this agreement. We are ready to occur, to, to give to the Palestinians in our country uh, full autonomy, as Begin said, but not a state of their own. And what they are getting now, or what they will get in the very soon future, will be an independent uh, Palestinian state on the same small territory on which uh, Israel exists, and I think it's a disaster. I believe that there's no doubt that there'll be a Palestinian state. I've spoken to some Palestinians who tell me that uh, it's a fate, of, it's, it's going to be absolutely a done deal. Well, but why does not the Prime Minister tell this to the people? Well, because he knows that the people is against, is still against them. The people are against the Palestinian state because Everybody understands that on such a small piece of land there couldn't be two independent states together. It was the view even of uh, Kissinger. He said it once uh, very clearly that it couldn't be on such a small piece of land uh, a existence, an existence of two states, two states that are not in love with each other, you know. And, but, uh, well, then uh, uh, Rabin, you know, says that uh, it will be a, uh, some uh, structure, but uh, not a state, not a state. Uh, uh, maybe de, de facto it will be a state, the U.S. it will not be a state. Well, it's not clear. I think, and, and the Palestinians themselves, they want to have a state, and they are sure they will get it, and they want Jerusalem as, uh, to have Jerusalem as the capital of this state. And you know, Jerusalem, Jerusalem is a reason that could be a reason for uh, an eternal war. Therefore, I think, I am sure that we are, by this agreement, we are not going towards peace. Do you think you're possibly going towards a civil war in this country? I don't think a civil war because you don't have among the Jewish people, the Israeli people, you don't have somebody who is ready to go to a civil war. We don't want to have a civil war, therefore it will not be a civil war, but it could be a war again between Arabs and Israelis. It's not peace, it's a war. So you think basically this document that they sign is not a document of peace, but it's a document N of a war in the future? Not at all. It doesn't lead us to peace because it couldn't work. It couldn't work. The Israelis may be from their side. They are ready to, to give up a lot, a lot of things. But the Palestinians, for them, they will not change anything. It's a stage in the theory of stages of Arafat and is very devoted to this uh, concept. Is getting what he could get and he will try, he will, uh, he will try to get more. And this will be, this will be his policy all the time. It, his policy is not a policy of peace, and he even doesn't say it. When he has an opportunity to speak to his people, to his Arab friends, he speaks about jihad, about a war. You were in the Knesset Thursday when the Prime Minister spoke to uh, the parliamentarians, the Knesset members. He changed his tune. Instead of speaking about a greater Jerusalem, he said Jerusalem plus. Do you understand that? What is it? Well, it's nonsense, you know, nonsense. 
it speaks, for instance, against the idea of uh, all of Israel, the entire Israel, is the first prime minister in the history of Israel to speak against the idea of the, of the land of Israel. The only one. You know, we could in the past understand Ben-Gurion and Eshkol and Golda Meir, great Jewish figures. And they've not been for the, not great Israel, but Israel couldn't be great, it's a small country, but not the land of Israel. And they said always, they love it, they admire it, but for some reasons of realpolitik, of uh, for peace, for instance, uh, we have to give up something. That I could understand, if not accept it, but to be in principle against the idea of all the land of Israel, this is really disastrous. You know, Rabin was the first to say it. I think he will regret it one day. Now, Rabin worked very closely with you, and I understand had a good relationship with you when you had your national unity government. Yes, of course, but we have never, never discussed politics. In you daily, never discuss the future? Never. In, the, in uh, daily matters, there have not been any difference of views. And he was very, very much interested in uh, to be the Minister of Defense, and therefore decided to be, to be with, with me in very good relations. But uh, no, we have not discussed the future and uh, not politics. Uh, well. And there was, there was this gap between him and Paris that encouraged me in <laughs> those times. Are you in shock, in a sense, by the behavior of Rabin? No, I am not in shock because I don't... Uh, I am in shock by the attitude of the people. I think we, we have, of course, now, I am sure that uh, half of the population is with my views, but we need more. We need more. And I think all the position of Rabin, all these concepts are not logical, illogical, and I would say not honest, not honest, because it doesn't say the, 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 the right, the, the truth. It doesn't say the truth. He said once about the Golanites that he will not leave it. Right, it's in a platform. Yeah, in his platform. How could, be, how could it be so that the prime minister says the could? The contrary of what he said a few days, a few years ago. But, well, I am not in shock. And I hope, I hope that we will find ways to change the course of history. The Leon Sharney Report congratulates the team of BDC, The Price of Peace, and Leon Sharney on the New York Emmy Awards win. The documentary reveals the true story of the negotiations leading up to the greatest diplomatic achievement of our time, the Camp David Accords between Israel and Egypt. Watch it on Hulu.com or buy the special feature edition DVD at select stores. Now get the book the hit movie was based on, Leon Charney's Backdoor Channels. Learn about the backdoor channel negotiations that led to the historic 1978 Israeli-Egyptian peace treaty. Become a witness to history and order backdoor channels online at Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Also available at all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at iTunes or Audible.com. Relive history. Order backdoor channels. Get best-selling author Leon Charney's latest book, The Battle of the Two Talmuds. Join Charney as he explores years of Jewish history to find out why and how Talmudic scholars and rabbis abandon the Holy Land for the lands of the diaspora. Learn about the power struggles behind the creation of the Jerusalem and Babylonian Talmuds. It's a book critics call engaging and enlightening, a book which will be of interest to people of every faith. Now available at Amazon and Barnes & Noble, or download the audiobook of The Battle of the Two Talmuds at iTunes or Audible.com. 
Leon Charney sets out to discover the true meaning of the Kaddish, the Jewish custom of reciting a prayer to commemorate the death of a close relative. Join Charney as he finds out the history of the Kaddish and how it has evolved. Reviewed as a refreshing walk through Jewish history and a book that deserves to be read by both Jews and non-Jews, The Mystery of the Kaddish is now available online at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at audible.com or on iTunes. Discover The Mystery of the Kaddish. Available now over iTunes, Amazon, and Google Play. Leon Charney's cantorial CD in Disco Lounge. Listen as Charney movingly sings El Mole Rachamim and Charney's amazing rendition of a disco remix of Adon Olam, all sung in the incredible and individual Charney style. Also listen to the CDs on Rhapsody. Download Leon Charney's cantorial songs in Disco Lam, the disco remix of Adon Olam on Amazon, iTunes, and Google Play. Or listen in on Rhapsody, all available now. We're back. We're speaking with Yitzchak Shamir, who's still a member of Knesset, but uh, has said that he wants to retire from his parliamentary duties at the end of his term and has uh, not taken any committees upon himself because he feels that the younger people should have a chance to work in those committees. Yitzchak, uh, Yitzchak Robin said some tough things about American Jews the other day. Uh. It's nonsense. I think it's nonsense what he said. Uh, he doesn't understand uh, the real situation of the Jewish people. The American Jewry is a great part of our people. We have to encourage it. We have to have a friendly, a very friendly dialogue with them. And even if you don't agree with them all the time, it's impossible to have all the time at the agreement of all of a, such a big population, but you have to, 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 to understand them and to explain and to have a dialogue. It's not, it's not a way, you know, to keep the unity of our people, because what the, 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 the Jewish people, after all, we are not very strong. It's, we have in all over the world, we have 13 millions now. In Israel, we have four and a half, four million and a half Jewish people. Right. It's not enough. It's not enough in this Middle East with a, such a great number of Arabs who don't like us. And I don't see them to like us in the near future. And therefore, we have to keep this unity of the Jewish people and the American Jewry with such many, such many possibilities, uh, many qualities. I still believe and I hope that many Jewish people from America will come here to live with us. I, I feel it already. I feel it. And this will give to us a lot of strength. We need them. And to come to them now and to speak with them in such a way, it's not Jewish, it's not patriotic. Speaking about America, the famous James Baker story where uh, Jim Baker, the Secretary of State, tried to hold up a $10, million, $10 billion guarantee. Yeah. This was during your reign of, uh, of uh, leadership. What is the real fact of that? Was well, of course, it was the decision of Bush. He promised the Arabs not to give us these 10 billions. Is that right? Right. He promised that. He promised the Syrians. He promised the Egyptians. He promised the Palestinians. And therefore, until not to give it to us, until we change our policy, until we accept this concept of land for peace, so, uh, you know, and I never, I have never been ready to, to accept this concept. And this was all the, 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 the thing. I, uh, my claim was that even Carter, that was not the greatest friend of Israel, he said that he said once to us, we have some uh, some disagreements. He told to us, he told to Mr. Begin, but I will never use it for economic pressure on you. I will never do it. 
and kept his promise, even Carter. And no American president did it. We got from the United States, I have not to, ex to, de to give details, a lot of help politically and in defense matters, in economic matters, but, and they have been always friends. And the first time when there was some blackmail, you know, some real brutal pressure was in the time of President Bush, and it was his decision. I hope he paid for it. <laughs> he did, he lost. <laughs> How many American presidents have you visited with? Well, uh, not many. I, uh, I visited there. Uh, I know a person, I know Carter and uh, uh, Reagan. Reagan, yes, of course, Reagan and Bush. Who was your favorite? Uh, Reagan was uh, extremely friendly. I love him. Really? Yeah. Do you stay in contact with him? Not, not now. <clears throat> not now. It's impossible to be in contact with him now. I got from time to time, I am getting some contact with the Secretary of State, Bush, uh, Schultz. 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 Interesting story about Schultz. The American community, Jewish community, was nervous about him because he came out of Bechtel yeah. when he first became uh, Secretary of uh, the Foreign Affairs. And uh, then he wound up being one of the most uh, yeah, loved yeah, uh, know, Secretaries of State. I am telling about it in my book, you know. And uh, my first meeting, or my first meeting with Schultz, we uh, talked about this uh, Bechtel issue. <laughs> Bechtel. Bechtel, yeah. And they told me, well, he's working for Bechtel, he worked for Bechtel, but he's a great friend of the Jewish people and of Israel. And after we had this talk, uh, a personal talk, he asked me, you trust me? And I told him immediately, every word of you. Really? Really. It's in the book? Yeah. And the book is Yitzhak Shamir, called Summing Up. You can buy it in every bookstore in the United States. It's uh, printed by Little Brown, and it's an insight into the memoirs of uh, Yitzhak Shamir, which have to be a classic. So I suggest everybody run to a bookstore right after the show, not during the show, and uh, pick up a copy of Yitzhak Shamir's book, Summing Up. <laughs> it's a fascinating story with uh, with with uh, Mr. Uh, uh, what's his name Schultz. Now, on the other hand, his twin cousin, Mr. Weinberger, yeah. was exactly the opposite. Yeah. Maybe he also worked at Bechtel. Yes, yes, I know, and there was always, you know, a certain clashes, uh, clashes between uh, Sh uh, Schultz and Weinberger all the time. Right. Uh, and it was not a very good friend of us, uh, Weinberger. But well, uh, yeah, the, the Regens, uh, the, Regens the, the term of uh, Reagan was very good for us. Tell me about your conversations with Reagan. Was he a very open guy? Was he? Well, he was good. He was well prepared. Uh, uh, you know, we have not. Uh, uh, we, we didn't go into details with him because he didn't He's not know. a detailed man. He's not a man of detail. But you have felt that he's a real friend of our cause. Genuine love of Israel. A genuine love, yes. He was a good friend and a real friend. He was, uh, by instinct, he was with us. Then he could not, ac not accept uh, some uh, positions of us. But... But he never muscled you? No, never. Let and me throw well, another name at you, Alexander Haig. He was always so also very good. So was very good. He was a friend of us. And well, but uh, well, it was for a short time. I was secretary for a short time. He was replaced by Schultz. And uh, Schultz was uh, excellent, excellent. And, you know, together with Schultz, with Schultz, we have worked for the repatriation of the Russian Jewry, of the Soviet Jewry. It was a great undertaking. And, you know, uh, and Reagan and Schultz, they had a great part in their uh, coming to Israel and the massive immigration to Israel. And I think uh, they have a great part in the uh, 
a failure in the collapse of the Soviet Union. They did it. Absolutely. They did it. Your feelings about people like Kissinger, have you met with Kissinger? Yes, many times. Many times, he's a lovely man and very intelligent, and I have not to praise him, everybody in America knows him. But well, uh, he was never against us. You remember the Yom Kippur War, I'm sure. Yeah, but uh, yes, in the Yom Kippur War, I was not in the government. It was in the time of the Golda Meir oh, government. Were yeah. you in the Knesset? Uh, not that I was elected. In, no, I was so. Yes, I was elected in the Knesset at the beginning of 74. 74. So you weren't there in 73? Yeah, yeah, this was in 73. One of the issues that I've always had trouble with was the Scuds of Israel. And uh, were you bullied by Bush to allow Israel to accept? No, I was not bullied. I think I was maybe, I was convinced. But I, I cannot say convinced, but. I understood the position of the United States, and even I spoke sometimes with, once I think with uh, Kissinger, he told me that before the affair came up, that the Americans are very worrying about, worried about it, that uh, after the Americans have uh, constructed this great coalition with the Arabs, it was for them uh, very dangerous that Israel participate in this war actively, and by this participation, it could uh, bring maybe to a collapse of this coalition. And it was in our greatest interest to have this coalition, to have this coalition sound and strong. And as I was sure that the victory will be on the side of the coalition, well, I decided that uh, we will try to do our utmost to defend ourselves, but not to endanger the coalition. Were you nervous that uh, Hussein had uh, nuclear warheads or something on his scuds? Uh, well, of course. we have. Uh, we didn't think that he has already already nuclear uh, arms, but maybe other other uh, some uh, means. But of course, you know, after all, the results uh, have justified our position. Would you say that was one of your toughest decisions, in a sense, to allow? Well, it was very tough, you know. It was, and well, uh, it was a matter of time. It took uh, less than a month. Uh, Every day was like a year, <laughs> and uh, it was very, very responsible, very responsible position. Was uh, it tough to hold back your military people? Uh, I don't think so. There have been some military people who think otherwise, not many of them, but uh, there was nothing matter, uh, some issue with the uh, general command. They've, uh, and they've understood my position, and they supported it. Uh, it was then, it was some questions with uh, some people of the government, some members of the government, because it was the first case in the history of Israel that Israel doesn't uh, respond. respond to such uh, an aggression. Right. And, well, uh, sometimes you have to be the first. <laughs> All right, we'll cut for commercial break. You talk about that in your book also? If you want. Uh, no, do you talk about it in your book? About the Scud, how you how you yes, handle Scuds? Yes, of course, scuds? of course. All right, so if you want to know more about Yitzhak Shamir uh, feelings during the Scuds of Israel, uh, buy this book, Summing Up by Yitzhak Shamir. Your toughest decision as a prime minister? Well, I don't know, you know, it's... There have been many tough decisions, but I think there have been some tough periods. And this uh, period you have mentioned before, the, the, the period of the Iraqi Scots, it was a very, very tough uh, time. And it was not easy to take decisions. No. It was entirely not easy. 
And, uh, well, uh, but I think that uh, the decision, my decision was right, and it was justified by the uh, events uh, uh, after that. And uh, now I think all the Israeli population, I think almost all of them, uh, agree with acknowledge it. it and I agree, I agree with it. Your greatest accomplishment as Prime Minister? Well, I think it was not easy. The greatest accomplishment Russian was jury? The, the immigration, the Aliyah, the immigration of the Russian Jewry. It was a struggle. It was a struggle for years. Uh, I was active in this struggle since the 50s. And, well, it was uh, lucky for us to get the great support of the United States for this struggle to open the gates of Soviet Russia for the Jews to get out. And uh, I think President Reagan and Secretary Schultz have worked for it uh, very strongly and all the time with uh, most of their energies. And uh, they got it. And without them, I am not sure that uh, we would uh, succeed. But we, it was a great accomplishment. You know, it goes on. Even now, you have uh, 70,000, uh, 80,000 jury. It's uh, not negligible. What I notice is they're very well absorbed here. They are very well absorbed because the special character of their people. You know, you have. Uh, Many, many men, uh, among them, uh, many people with the highest qualifications. Scientists, engineers. Many scientists, many were good professionals. And well... Uh, Where were you born originally? I was born in, in, on the border between Poland and Russia. Now it's White Russia. <laughs> Belarus. 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 Now I visited once there, in my shtetl was this small place. I visited once uh, now. So it's got to be a tremendous internal satisfaction for you to see 600,000. Oh, well, uh, I am really happy about it, and I think it's going on. And we will have, uh, in this near future, we will have, I think, one or two million of these Jewish people. And it's a very great, uh, source of strength to our uh, country. Well, and uh, I hope that we will have other Jewish people too. I think you one told day. Told me that Americans are uh, immigrating. One here? day, I think some American Jewish people will come here and will invest their part, their qualifications, and we need them. We need them very, very uh, hard. You've seen a lot of people in your lifetime. You've read a lot of books. Do you have a historical hero, someone that you... <coughs> well, many, many, you know. I mean, first of all, the Jewish heroes, you know, in the Bible. It's like, uh, like people uh, I've met yesterday, the King David <laughs> <laughs> and his uh, military commanders. You know, and well, uh, the the Maccabees. So you were a follower of uh, Jabotinsky? Yes, of course, yes. And well, Jabotinsky was my teacher, my political teacher. You knew him well? Uh, not very well, but I read everything he wrote. His doctrines? All his books, all his things. He wrote a lot of articles of books. And well, uh, on the outside world, uh, it's curiously, I was a great uh, admirer of Mao Zedong. <laughs> <laughs> Mao Zedong, I, I have not accepted, never accepted his theories, but he did something great for the Chinese people. For the, the first time, he gave them food to eat and not to be hungry. You know, I remember in my childhood, 
in China was always a flood of angers, of epidemi epidemics. Famine. 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 And when he came, he found a way to give everybody enough rice to live with. So he was a great hero. A great hero. And oh. therefore, I, I admired him. Do you have an opinion about Winston Churchill? Well, he was a great man. He saved the world from the Nazis. There is no doubt about it. After uh, my uh, Chamberlain uh, got the, the, the majority of the parliament, uh, I think uh, Churchill saved the world. Of course, with the help of America, all that. But uh, was a great man. Did you know Margaret Thatcher? Yes, I know. I know him. I read uh, her memoirs. Is she an Iron Lady? She's an Iron Lady. I, I wouldn't like to be a member of her cabinet. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I know you're in a rush. We're running out of time. I, I want to talk about Baker in Madrid and uh, then close this. Your opinion of Jim Baker? Well, Baker was. Uh, well, I have not to say he was a very intelligent man and a very good foreign minister, foreign secretary. And he's a clever man, a clever man. I had the impression that he, he was carrying out the policy of President Bush. Because uh, I have spent with him a lot of time and I explained to him our positions. And uh, I cannot claim that he was tricky with me, but well, uh, he, on the other end, he played a certain role in the American policy with the Arab side, with all these people, uh, Syria and uh, the Palestinians and Egypt and all the others. He promised them, he gave them some promises. Uh, and they came to the Madrid conference uh, because uh, they believed that uh, when it will come to the stage of the permanent, uh, of the uh, negotiations about the permanent solutions, America will be on their side. They hoped that uh, Bush will be the president all the time and they will support their views. Would you uh, say that Bush was pro-Arab? He was pro-Arab, without doubt. No question. No question about it. He really believed that they are right. And uh, he said it uh, sometimes, and other Americans uh, supported this, uh, this thesis. Were you, uh, why did you go to the Madrid Peace Conference? Because I wanted peace, I wanted to have peace, you know. We have been in this time in a very good position, a very good situation in Israel. And I think it was our quest, all the time, the quest for peace, because peace is necessary for a country to develop, to develop its economy, to develop its uh, well-being. Of course, I didn't think uh, going to this conference to give up a part of our territory. I don't think uh, it's a necessary price for peace. I don't know any other country in the world that is giving up <laughs> its territory, even for peace. But I wanted to get peace, peace with the Arabs, why not? We have to live in peace here, but not at any price. My last question, 10 years from now, what will Israel look like? Well, it depends. It depends if we will uh, succeed to nullify these last agreements with the PLO. I think our situation will be excellent. We will have here 10 million of Jewish people, and uh, even a less, a bit, a bit less, and uh, Israel will be a very important country uh, in all respects economically, culturally, politically. You see, you see a good Israel in yes, 10 years. Yes, of course. But you have to nullify that agreement. Yes, of course. Mr. Shamir, thank well, you very much for coming. Thank you. <laughs>